All right. Um, so um, this uh, the work the goals of this workshop are to give you a basic um, understanding of uh, of what GIS programs uh, GIS software even means um, and uh, how they can be used in the most basic sense um, for organismal biology research um, and other initiatives. Um, so uh, as a part of this workshop, I also want you to be able to identify the various uh, formats with which you can um, uh, manipulate and use in GIS uh, software, specifically QGIS. Um, uh, I want you to be able to know how to access the information that is stored in QGIS once you've imported uh, data into that program, um, being able to manipulate the visual features of spatial data. Um, and finally, if there's time, I'd like uh, for us to be able to uh, talk about how to create a basic map for you to use as like a figure or something and teach you the principles behind creating these sorts of maps. Um, so uh, before we get any further, I want to say um, we're gonna jump like fast forward ahead, like about an hour into the workshop here. So click on this link on the Google uh, document here. Um, and uh, here, let's see, can it? And we want to download this immediately because it's a huge file, um, but it'll be uh, necessary for getting um, elevational data for um, uh, for the file we end up creating. So I want to I want to have that downloading in the background while we are working on other stuff. So um, just click on this download original GeoTIFF button. And then you will want to save it to a file or a folder on your computer. So I've actually created a folder on my computer called QGIS Workshop. I would encourage you to do something the same, similar, just to help you stay organized. And that's a key um, component uh, or something that you need to be uh, consistently aware of when you're using GIS software is your, your data files that go into a given um, uh, data set need to be really organized because that really affects how you can use them in the program. So um, I created a separate folder here um, for the for layers, um, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, just go ahead and, and drop it in uh, in any sort of folder as long as you know how to access it later and then click save. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and, and save it too, just so I get a sense as to how long it'll take. Yeah, so this is like a, um, it's like a 1.2 gigabyte archive compressed. Um, that's because it's this massive like 50,000 by 30,000 pixel TIFF image um, that has resolution on uh, elevational data for the entire lower 48 states and parts of Canada and Mexico. So massive file. Um, uh, let's get that started while we, while we talk about other things. Um, and I should also mention, uh, just in case it wasn't, um, uh, uh, in case you, you missed an email or something, that I'm going to be assuming that you already have QGIS installed. Um, if for some reason you don't, um, I'd encourage you to look up uh, download.qgis.org uh, ASAP and get started on downloading and installing that file. Um, while uh, while I move ahead, um, you'll have be, be having to play a little bit of catch up, um, uh, but there's always going to be the recording, which I'll try to post to YouTube, um, so you can uh, use that as um, uh, uh, to to catch up on the things that you missed. So um, I think that's all I want to say about that. So um, I'll get started, and I'll pull up in sort of an example or test file that I generated. Um, to, to discuss some of the basic features here. Um, so if you're seeing my screen, um, and uh, let me know if you aren't, um, uh, you should see a map of uh, Arizona with a bunch of little blocks on it. Um, this is the, the basic QGIS um, uh, project viewer uh, screen here. So we've got you know our standard uh, different options for uh, interacting with various uh, aspects of the data. We have some basic tools. We can zoom in um, using this tool and it'll, uh, um, it'll zoom in according to how we click and drag across the screen. 
Um, we can zoom in so that the entirety of our data set is captured. Um, and uh, that's uh, the reason why it's zoomed out so far is that this is actually like a, a global data set that I, um, uh, I have of various layers that are hiding stuff that aren't interesting. Anyway, um, uh, you, this is the, just the basic pan uh, tool for clicking and dragging. You can also use uh, the middle mouse button if, you're, uh, if your mouse has that sort of thing. Um, I've got one question in the chat. Let me check this real quick. I can't see the screen. I just see your web search. Oops. Um, give me just one minute here. Thanks for posting that. Um, okay. One moment, please. Share screen. Let's just go to this guy. All right. How's this? Can you see the window now? Okay, thanks so much. Um, thanks for pointing that out. I appreciate that. Okay, um, so uh, I'll start over then. Um, so this is the basic layout of, uh, of the QGIS project viewer uh, uh, layout. So we've got um, uh, we've got just a test map of Arizona here. Um, uh, different toolbars for uh, excuse me, different options for interacting with the um, the uh, data here, and we'll go over a few of these. Um, in a little bit, um, different options for um, uh, viewing the uh, stuff on the screen here. Um, you have your zoom options here. You can use this to click and drag um, uh, an area of interest that you want to zoom into um, and zoom out from, uh, so on and so forth. Um, the pan tool just lets you click and drag, or you can use the middle mouse button to do that. Um, let's see here. Um, we also have uh, these tools over here. They're a little bit more advanced. They're for interacting with the features on your um, on your data set. And I will um, I'll explain these in more detail when you all have a data set in front of you that you can uh, work along with me. Um, on the left hand side of the screen here, we have um, a, a browser which is useful for if you want to import certain files. Um, into this uh, program for uh, manipulating. Um, I don't actually use this uh, very often myself, so I'm actually just going to click and drag this up. I do use this layers uh, box all the time, though. This has all of the current imported um, uh, data files of this map that I can toggle on and off um, as, a, uh, as appropriate. So uh, right now I have this Arizona land ownership um, data file uh, visible, I can turn that off. Um, and instead, I can turn on uh, this uh, world clim uh, mean annual temperature data set, um, and so on and so forth. I can turn on biotic communities. And they're all just different. Uh, they all contain different information um, about uh, um, about uh, the, the geographic uh, region of interest. Um, uh, there are di many different types of data. Um, there are, uh, so you can see these images, they have this sort of checkerboard pattern. That means that they are a raster layer, um, uh, which is basically just an array of pixels, um, like a JPEG image or a PNG image, um, uh, such that you know if you were to expand or uh, shrink the resolution of this image, um, it would not increase in resolution at all. Um, so if we zoom in really far here, you see that it gets really pixelated. Um, and uh, uh, um, we have, um, uh, but, excuse me, if we have uh, these other guys here, um, let's see, we have line, uh, excuse me, vector layers. Um, oops, I have the wrong tool selected. We have vector layers as well, um, like these lakes and rivers. Uh, these are mathematically defined um, so that uh, we can zoom in really far and there's no decrease or increase in resolution. Um, and so that, that uh, I mentioned that because that determines how the data are input and stored um, uh, and handled by 
uh, GIS software. Um, if there are lines or, or geometric shapes, then that's different than um, flat images, basically. So, and those, um, uh, those are represented by lines um, and these little squiggly things. Um, and then we also have point, uh, point data as well. And so you could use that for, um, uh, for anything from marking cities to marking um, uh, like occurrence data for um, you know, species that you've gone out and sampled or uh, uh, species that you've, or that you've obtained data from, uh, from a, a biorepository or something, an online repository. Yeah, Eric has a question. Yeah, um, Eric asked if you can use this program for, uh, for doing like a gap analysis to figure out uh, where sampling has or hasn't occurred, um, among other things. And yeah, you definitely could. Um, a lot of it depends on um, the quality of the data that you're reading in and how um, confident you are that those data are representative of sampling effort. Um, but yeah, the, fundamentally, you could you could use this for that for that purpose. Um, okay, so uh, that's just a basic overview of like what we're looking at here. Um, like I was saying, the layers uh, bar we're going to be using this a lot. This is a really important feature of GIS. So. Um, just a couple last things that I'll mention before we go on and, and grab some data that we can uh, we can start wrangling. Um, the uh, uh, when I was first starting to use GIS software, um, I uh, didn't really appreciate the um, the way in which GIS software handles data. Um, it's not sort of like your um, adding data that is stored in the program. Uh, the program is merely um, accessing the location on your computer where the data are found um, and then uh, doing a bunch of stuff to those data, but only in the program. Um, and so I mentioned that because um, when you are adding or retrieving data from an existing data set, um, you have to make sure that the uh, that you're not moving around the files that you're importing into QGIS because every time you open or interact with your data set, um, it's going to be uh, actively checking to make sure that those files are still where you said they were um, the last time you had the program open. So I think of um, I think of QGIS as less a um, uh, a place to shove a bunch of data and more a place that, uh, or a program that interacts with data. Um, and you can, you can uh, visualize and manipulate those data. And in some cases you can uh, save those changes to the file directly, um, but I rarely do that. I usually use uh, GIS software for, um, uh, for visualizing the data and making, um, making like maps and stuff um, and not, changing the data, the quality of the data um, that are being read into it. Uh, hopefully that hopefully that makes sense. And, and hopefully you'll see a little bit more uh, about what I mean um, once we start um, messing with some data here. Um, so to get things started, you, you, uh, we can click on, um, you can follow along and click on new project here. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah, sure, I'll save these changes. So, um, so, okay, so we've got our untitled project here and it's just a blank screen. Um, and this is, you know, probably one of the other obvious features uh, about QGIS or any sort of uh, GIS software is it doesn't automatically create a map for you. You have to tell it everything from start to finish, like what region of interest you have um, and so on and so forth. There's like no, built-in maps. Everything needs to be downloaded from somewhere. Um, there are some places where you can go to get like starter or tutorial data sets, um, uh, but uh, I'm going to have a start from scratch because it, uh, it helps to show the process behind which um, you can uh, uh, acquire uh, data of various types. Okay, so um, let's see here. 
if I switch to my browser, can you still see the, uh, can you see my internet browser now? Okay, cool, awesome. Um, all right, so this is where we're gonna start using some of those links that I was uh, talking about uh, earlier. Um, so there are uh, basically these first four links all have differing um, data sources, uh, or they have data of differing types that we'll pick and choose a little bit from here and there. Um, and unfortunately, there isn't one really great spot for you to be able to find um, all of the different data that you would want for any project. You sort of have to, I guess, just get lucky. Um, I do a lot of Googling with um, what kind of data that I'm looking for. Uh, my, my Google search history has lots of stuff like um, United States political boundaries, GIS download and stuff like that. So um, I wish I had a better solution for you, um, but uh, um, uh, this, is the, this is the best that I've been able to compile for now. Um, and it's worth noting that most of these are very active, um, actively used databases. Um, and so they are subject to change over the future. Um, and, uh, and so the long-term usability of any of these links, uh, I'm, I'm looking at this one in particular right here, is not guaranteed. And I'll explain why, because we're gonna start there. So go ahead and click on this, uh, this first link, the University of Arizona Spatial Data Explorer. And it'll open up this new uh, page here with a blank gridded screen. Um, and so there's, uh, I, I love this interface. I think it's, uh, even though it's a little buggy and we'll, we'll see those bugs firsthand in a second, um, it's a great way of figuring out which data are, um, uh, like what you're, uh, it's a, first of all, it's a very wide ranging data source and has a lot of, um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, it's very user friendly. That's what I'll that's what I'll say. Okay, so the first thing that we want to look up here is let's do United States uh, political boundaries. <laughs> okay, so um, if you when you enter in a search, <coughs> it shows up with a list of uh, a huge list of different uh, types of data uh, based on your search results. Um, and so the key things that I look for are, uh, is it recent? Um, is it uh, created by a government body? Um, and it doesn't have to be, but if it is, then it, it makes me feel more confident in the quality of the data. So this is, you know, United States Bureau of Transportation Statistics, um, uh, some of them are, you know, U.S. Geological Survey um, and things like that. Um, and then the third thing that I look for is what's the repository in which these data are um, made available. And the reason why that is important is because um, even though most of the data are uh, public domain, um, meaning that anyone can use them, um, sometimes the repositories that host the data do not hold those uh, or do not make those data um, accessible to everybody. Um, so this is a University of Arizona database. Um, and if you are trying to get data from the U of A, um, which we can, uh, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, basically, we can't access that without a U of A uh, email um, uh, address. So um, that's where our options are limited in using the Spatial Data Explorer. But uh, we can still get a lot of good stuff from this. So I'm going to start by, um, let's see, state boundaries, United States and territories. Let's try this one. And so if we click on this view checkbox, it will pop up with a preview of, um, of, a, uh, of what the data will look like. Um, and this looks good to me. It's got Arizona here. Um, that's what I want to focus on for the purposes of this workshop. Um, so our options are twofold. We can either download this file uh, as is, 
um, or we can add it to our cart, um, which doesn't mean we're not going to buy anything. It's just a way that um, it will save our various search results so we can go and download everything right at the end. So um, uh, I would add in this polygon layer, state boundaries, United States and territories 2012. Um, and so you'll notice that the, uh, these, uh, these search results have different um, data types. So the, these polygons means that, mean that there are uh, shapes defined by the, um, by the layer. Um, and this line marker means that it's just a set of lines. Um, a set of a bunch of line segments. And so in this case, the polygons are preferable because each polygon can be identified in the data file as a state, and, and that will be important for later. Okay, so go ahead and add this file to your cart. Um, and let's do another search here. Let's look for uh, interstates. Okay, so um, interstate highways, Arizona, 1988. Yep, so um, this is the problem that we would run into. So um, uh, this would be a great set of data to have. However, if we try clicking on this download button, you'll see that it asks us to sign in to be able to download it. And we don't have uh, U of A credentials, so we can't do this, unfortunately. Um, uh, so um, none of the other data that are in this U of A spatial data explorer seem to be what we're looking for. So let's try um, let's try something else here. Uh, we already got the elevational data. Um, let's try roads. Um, actually, let's try, sorry, let's try highways. So we're going to scroll. Hmm, let's be a little bit more specific, United States highways. Highways features, United States 2011. That'll work. Um, so let's visualize these data. Uh, oh, there it is. So this layer is huge. It's got a lot of lines because it's got most of the uh, paved roads in the United States in it. Um, yeah, so... Um, and I, I love these, uh, I love GIS software just because it's so illustrative in just looking at how the development of the United States has, um, has occurred in terms of its infrastructure. Um, and okay, I think it's stopped loading, but that's fine. Uh, we'll just add it to our cart and we'll download those together. Okay, so most of the other stuff that I, uh, I had, um, that, would, that I would like to download, we'll have to get from other sources. Um, so um, that's fine. We'll just download these roads and uh, these state boundaries. So um, now that we've got these two items here, uh, go to your cart and then for each, ob or for each item, we'll click on DL. Um, and so we wanna save the file and uh, oh yeah, so this is this is where we start to um, uh, run into problems if we don't stay organized here. So um, uh, you will want to give each folder a or each archive a descriptive name. Um, so I will call this uh, uh, this is uh, state boundaries. That's it. Um, actually, I want to before I do that, I'm going to rename this other file. Um, the elevational data, um, elevational data zip. And so I'll call this one state. Can you just click the download thing and make the download? 
Oh, did it automatically download for you without asking for uh, uh, to input a file name or something? Yeah, I was kind of looking. Okay, so if it automatically downloads without you, um, uh, it without it asking for you to specify a file name, uh, I use Firefox, but it might be browser dependent. You may have to go into your um, uh, download history. Um, and in Firefox, I'd just click show all downloads. Um, and then the, uh, the files should appear, but I don't know how it works for Chrome or uh, Safari or the various other browsers that you could use. Um, so um, if that's the case, um, so for me, I would go to right click the file and then go to open containing folder. And then uh, it will show you the location of your downloads. Um, and at that point, you can use the date at which you downloaded the archive as a uh, means of identifying which uh, file it was. Uh, yeah, Eric? Oh, OK. So, so some folks are having problems with just getting the download to run at all. Um, um, oh, would you mind flipping the switch in the back there? Oh, there we go. Thank you. I guess they're both on. Um, so, uh, so if that is the case, um, let's see, we might have some other options available to us. Um, uh, so let's see here. Can you, um, can you try downloading it straight from the search results list? <clears throat> um, is anyone else uh, who's attending remotely uh, having these same issues? Okay. Having trouble searching. Okay. Um, well, uh, okay. So let's try a different source then. Um, and that's the that's the beauty of these is that because they're publicly uh, they're public domain um, resources, we can uh, you know just search. Shoot, uh, U.S. states. Let's look at that. It's in my first. Uh, uh, first item in my autocomplete. So a shape file is one of the primary uh, file types that can be used by GIS software. Cartographic boundary files, shape file, census bureau, uscensus.gov. Okay. Um, so this is a website that's new to me, so we'll have to uh, figure out how to get these data. Um, states. US state 500K. Oh, this might not be what we were looking for. Um, let's see. But we can try it out anyway. Um, let's do the uh, let's do the 20 meter resolution dot zip. Okay, so um, uh, I will wait for y'all to catch up to me. So just to uh, just to refresh, I went to oops. I just typed in US states shape file and then clicked on this first link that's uh, census.gov. I'll post the link in the chat for you. Yep. Okay. 
So, um, and now once you're on this page, we'll go down to um, the CB 2018 US state 20 meters. And then I'm going to save this file under this folder I created called political divisions. And then um, I'll just call this one state boundaries three. I have two other folders in here because I was testing some stuff out earlier. So you can name it whatever you want, as long as you can find it in the future. Let me know if you're running into problems with this. This one worked? Okay, cool. Um, feel, free to, feel free to post in the chat if you're having trouble. Okay. Um, so the other thing that we are going to look for is let's not look for highways. Let's try and look for interstates. Okay. So, uh, United States interstate shape file, uh, United States. Okay. So this is from Stanford. Um, Stanford is a nice, has a really nice, uh, GIS repository. Okay, United States National Transportation Atlas, Interstate Highways, 2008. So let me post this one in the chat. Um, are the folks in person, are y'all, do you find this one okay? Okay. Um, all right, we're gonna download the original shape file here. This one's also called data. So I'm gonna save this under infrastructure. And we'll call this one interstates. Okay, now um, for the other data from uh, that are going to be specific to Arizona, we're going to go back to our um, uh, outline here and use the uh, Arizona Geospatial Data and Maps database. So interestingly enough, this is another U of A resource that has the same exact files that are on the spatial data uh, um, uh, service that, that we started off using, but the, the, for whatever reason, we don't need uh, U of A credentials to access these uh, publicly available data. Okay, so um, we'll click on the download data link. Um, it is worth reading about the, the um, information behind that, but it'll take too long. So, um, so we're not going to do that. So this first sentence here is really important. All data are in shapefile format, NAD83, UTM zone 12, um, and, and meters projection. Um, and the reason why this is important is because there are a zillion different ways of, um, of specifying where on the world you are located. And uh, a built-in feature of any GIS program is the ability to make these different forms of positioning talk to one another. But it requires that you're paying attention to how the data are, um, uh, how, how, the, how the coordinate system exists in each separate data file. Um, because if you are working with any number of um, different layers, the layers may have different, uh, what are called uh, projection or coordinate reference systems. Um, and, uh, and you need to be able to say, this one is NAD 83, this one is WGS 84, so that they can both appear in the right spot together. It's basically like translating different languages, uh, but with the click of a button. Okay, so with that, that aside, um, we'll talk more about what this means once we get the files downloaded. Let's go to, um, I was looking for, can we do uh, water? Yes, okay. So we want to get, um, we want to get, let's do this major rivers with main stem dot zip. And I will save that one in a file called a folder called hydrology. You can see I actually already have that one uh, saved. So 
Um, just save it. And then let's also do major rivers, main stem, primary and secondary tributaries. This last one of the uh, four uh, data sets about rivers. I'll explain why once we get those in front of us. Okay, so I'm just gonna save this guy again. Again, the, uh, I have that pop-up occur because I already downloaded these files before the workshop. Yeah, sorry. So just to repeat, the first one is major rivers. The second one is major rivers, main stem, or I'm sorry, oof. Uh, sorry, the first one is major rivers with main stem, uh, my mistake. Um, and then the second one is major rivers, main stem, primary and secondary tributaries. Um, but honestly, feel free to download as many of these as you like. Um, they're not going to hamper your uh, um, ability to follow along in the future, I don't think. Um, uh, and they're, they're all informative data sets. And then the last one from this, um, the last one from this uh, data set is let's install uh, lakes and reservoirs or download lakes and reservoirs. All right, so I'll give folks a minute to catch up again. Um, so again, we want major rivers with main stem, major river, main stem, primary and secondary tribs, and then lakes and reservoirs. Okay. So um, let's go back to this pick list and just see if there's any other stuff that we wanna look at here. Uh, definitely, we want land. So uh, when, we, when we're done with water, let's move to land. So from here, we'll click on landownership.zip and we'll save that guy. I'm gonna save this into another file called um, political divisions. Again, I've already got this one downloaded. How's everyone in the uh, remote chat doing? Is, are y'all following along? Cool, great. Don't hesitate to ask questions if you need, uh, need reminders or direction. Okay, so um, just for funsies, let's also go to climate. And, um, oh, mean daily average temperature. That one seems fun. We can do mean daily maximum temperature. Tell you what, just pick one that sounds fun to you. Um, and, and let's do it. Doesn't even have to be on this page. Okay, so I'm gonna save this under, um, this is, I'll say this under geological and biological. Uh, and these ones don't have a really um, straightforward name. So I'm just gonna call this one mean annual temperature. Okay. So, is everyone following along? Okay. I'll wait, I'll wait just a, a couple minutes here for folks to, to get caught up. I downloaded um, mean, uh, mean daily average temperature. Um, and, but you're welcome to download um, any of them. Oops, I need to change something. I named that archive wrong. So I'm gonna go back to my folder here. 
um, and go to, I'm in this one mean annual temperature and it's not mean annual temperature, it's uh, mean daily average temperature. Just basically splitting hairs, but you know, it is what it is. What do we need from the Stanford site? Oh yes, um, so from the Stanford site, um, we downloaded the, uh, the National Transportation Atlas Interstate Highways. Uh, oops, I'll post that link back into the chat so you can access it. Um, and then the first, uh, so, so technically we downloaded two things. The, first, or the, the second was this, um, was the interstates. The first was right when I said at the beginning, uh, this, uh, this data file here, the 100 meter uh, resolution elevation of the conterminous United States. Um, and that one I said, let's start that at the very beginning uh, because it's a huge file and we'll wanna give it as much time as we can to finish downloading so it's ready for us to use. Say it again, Eric. Oh, I'm just saying, you're talking about this one that we downloaded. Yeah, this one is the, yeah, the very first one. Okay. Um, all right, so I think that's all we need from the, uh, where was it? The, this guy from the um, U of A uh, Institutional Repository site. So um, let's go back to our outline here. Um, and so, The, yeah, I think I'll wait to talk about this until we actually start manipulating our other data in uh, GIS. So let's pull this guy open. Let's go back to our, our QGIS window here. And now let's start bringing data in. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to go to, assuming that you're on this white screen, you're, uh, you've gone to a new project, um, we're going to click on layer, add layer, and we're going to add a vector layer. And so this is why I mentioned before the difference between vector and raster layers, and we'll also talk about delimited text layers today, um, is because they're handled by the program differently. And so you know, need to know a little bit about what data type uh, you just downloaded before you can use it. Otherwise, you'll get an error or it won't show up. So um, when we click add vector layer, it pulls up this uh, data source manager. Um, and uh, really the only thing that you need to worry about on this uh, screen right now is this little ellipsis button. It's hilariously small, but it's important. And that's because it will let us um, pull up the, uh, uh, direct, it, direct the program to the file we want to uh, add as a layer. So, um, I'm going to play a little bit fast and loose here. Oftentimes you can add layers straight from a zip archive. And so they can stay compressed on your computer without you having to extract the uh, files and have them take up a bunch of space. It doesn't always work, um, but it often does. So let's start with that because it will uh, save space, precious space on all of our hard disks. Okay, so um, I'm going to click add. And um, it should pop up with this little uh, uh, dialog box here that has a list of the files included in that archive. And we only need one of them. We need the file, or we need the file that ends in .shp. And that, in this case, it's layer uh, layer ID zero, um, but it might not always be that. But we just need the .shp one. Okay, and it, it added it automatically. So I'm gonna close this out for a sec and just zoom in here. Feel free to follow along. So here is our, um, our basic uh, uh, information from the layer we just added. It's got Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Alaska, and the 48. Um, uh, you'll, you might notice, um, I believe this is new to, uh, 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 version 3.16 and above, 
because uh, when I ran this same uh, the same operation under my old version, which was 3.10, this question mark didn't appear. Um, and so what this is saying is that the layer has no coordinate reference system set. Um, and so we need to specify that so that the program uh, knows how to relate this uh, layer with other uh, layers on or that we add subsequently. So we're going to right click this, um, this uh, layer and entry, and then go to layer CRS and set it to actually we won't we won't pick it from this list this time. We'll click on um, uh, sorry autopilot here. We'll click on set layer CRS and it pulls up this window. And this is what I was saying just a minute ago about um, uh, making sure that you know or have an idea about what coordinate reference system your layer was created under um, so that you can have your different layers talk to each other. We've got a question in the chat. Oh, sorry, Bronson. I'll back up for everyone. I think I was going a little too fast for everybody. Thanks for speaking up. So um, I'm going to remove this guy and we'll just, uh, we'll do it again. So I'm going to go to layer up in the top left here. Um, and then we'll go to add layer and then click on uh, add vector layer. Um, and then, so it pulls up this uh, data source manager box, um, which we will then go to uh, um, uh, in the, I'll clear this out. We'll click on this little ellipsis button. And so it might not be in the same place for you as it was for me, because uh, it sort of automatically detected where I wanted to go. I just navigated to my folder where I have stored all of the layers for the QGIS uh, workshop. Um, and then I found the layer that says uh, state boundaries. And I picked uh, this one that I just downloaded um, a few minutes ago. I tried, I, I feel like the state boundaries and then like I got lost, but I couldn't maneuver around too well. Um, <laughs> as in you couldn't find the file again? No, 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 like, so I downloaded it and put it in. Oh, there, I see. And it got lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we can, uh, Eric is saying that he got last, lost because he clicked and dragged around a little too far. So, um, so we'll click on add to add this, uh, uh, this file. Um, and then we'll click on the, the, the file, the entry that ends in .shp. Um, and then we'll click on close. And so if you like, if you know, if you go off way off into here, and uh, so I'm on like the Eastern hemisphere now, um, and you want to find your, uh, your data source or your, um, your layers of interest again, you'll click on um, uh, zoom full. And it should bring you back to being able to see your, um, your data again. Um, the other way you can, you can do that is by right clicking on a layer of interest and then selecting zoom to layer. And it should do the same thing. Okay, so um, at this point is, uh, is everyone at the, uh, can basically see, uh, see this. You can see the, the United States layer um, on QGIS. Eric, Mary, okay, cool, awesome. Um, I'm not, I'm not hearing any screaming telling me to stop and go backwards. So I'm gonna uh, let's keep charging ahead. Um, okay, so um, as I was saying before, we need to tell QGIS what the coordinate reference system for this file is. So to do that, you can either click on this uh, question mark here, or you can right click and then go to layer CRS. Right now it says no CRS, and we want to set it. And remember, CRS stands for coordinate reference system. And the reason why it exists is because there are a bunch of different ways to indicate to someone that you are at a specific spot on the globe. Most of the time, and by most, I mean like 51% of the time, um, 
uh, it's going to be WGS 84. So that is a good place to start, especially within the US. Um, uh, that's gonna be a good place to start. WGS 84 is the international standard. Um, I think it stands for like World Geological Survey uh, 1984. Um, and uh, it was, it's like a standard that, or uh, excuse me, World Geodetic System 1984, it says it right here. Um, uh, it was a standard developed in 1984 um, uh, and it, it gained so much traction because it in part is what the GPS system uh, is based on. So uh, mo like most of the time GPS we use WGS 84 because basically the satellites that position a, or have your position located when you use a GPS um, device will be using this uh, standard. So let's uh, select WGS 84. Oh. Yeah, so uh, um, Melek asks, what WGS 84 do we choose? And it's true that there are a ton of them. Um, most of them don't matter. Uh, or they're basically the same. Um, there might be like tiny differences that um, I have ha I have not figured out what is different about them, um, which is the part of this workshop where I remind you of the caveat where I teach you just enough to be dangerous. Um, so, uh, but for uh, what I would recommend doing is using 4326 because that's the default for QGIS. And you can actually filter all of everything else if you just type in 4326 in the filter box here. Um, and don't ask me why it's numbered that. Uh, I, I also can't remember what EPSG stands for off the top of my head, but a Google search would tell you. Um, so we'll select this one and, um, and you'll see in the bottom right here, uh, this EPSG 4326. This is what's called the project coordinate reference system. And this is the, um, this is what um, all of the other data sources, regardless of their coordinate reference system are transformed to for us. And that's what we see on the screen is this, uh, is this transformation to WGS 84. Um, and we can play around with what that means if there's time, but for now, let's just uh, work under the assumption that we're gonna be keep using uh, WGS 84. So um, a couple things uh, that we'll do with this layer before we move on to adding in other uh, layers um, and uh, uh, post in the chat if you need me to slow down um, is we're going to mess with the, the uh, visual properties of this layer just a little bit first before we start adding in other, uh, other layers. So uh, right click on the um, on this entry here and then click on styles and then let's go to edit symbol. And so this, uh, this menu pull, uh, this menu basically controls what we see on the screen in terms of colors, line width, et cetera. Um, and uh, really we only need to edit this guy right here. Um, so um, we can, uh, oops, I didn't mean to click that. We want to keep this a simple fill. This basically says what each shape on this um, uh, on this layer looks like. But we'll we don't want this ugly orange color. Um, we're gonna make it. Let's just make it white. If you wanted, you could also make it transparent by dragging this box all the way, uh, the opacity box, all the or slider all the way to zero. But let's just do white for now. Oh uh, yeah, you have a question, Eric. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, Eric, Eric was asking how I got to this menu. So I right clicked on the layer entry and then uh, went to styles and then went to edit symbol. Um, so we can also, you know, we can adjust the, um, the stroke width. Thanks for joining us. Um, and if we wanna make the lines thicker, I'm not going to bother. Um, well, it's fine as is. Um, okay, so now we've got our boring, uh, but uh, visually effective white background here. 
Um, so uh, the next thing that we'll do is, oops, we will add in another layer. We've got a few to add in still. So um, how's everyone's download on the elevational data looking? Post in the chat. Let me know if you it hasn't finished downloaded downloading yet. Yours, yours is good, Mary. Same with you, Eric. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone say that theirs isn't done. So I'm going to, uh, let's do that one next because elevational data is uh, really fun to work with, I think. Plus, it'll give us a chance to work with raster layers. So um, we're gonna click on add raster layer from this layer, add layer, add raster layer. Uh, menu. Oops. And you'll see it's basically a very, it's a very similar um, uh, uh, menu here. We want to click on this ellipsis button. And uh, we're going to go to wherever you saved the elevational data. And I'm actually going to move this to this geological and biological uh, folder here. So elevational data. So I, again, I'm, I'm going to try adding it just from the archive first. So I don't have to um, extract all of these files from this like 1.2 gig compressed archive. Okay, let's click add. Ah, bummer. So see, this is what I was saying. It doesn't want to, uh, oops, it went away too quickly. Um, it doesn't want to add the, it doesn't want to add this layer in the archive itself. Oh, let's see. It says, cannot open GDAL data set. And that basically means that it wasn't able to, um, it wasn't able to, to see the files uh, without them being extracted. Okay, so what we'll have to do is we'll have to manually, or we'll have to go to where the file is located um, and I'll, I'll give everyone a minute to catch up here. So find your file in Finder or Windows Explorer um, or whatever you're using. Question in the chat. So mine gave me an option to select items to add. If that's the case, then great. Um, uh, but for the purposes of uh, following a, uh, or just like, so I, so I can explain how to do it. I would follow along and um, extract it for now, and then I can show you which file to select. So you can then um, do it while the folder is still um, uh, archived or compressed or whatever you want to use. Um, okay, so um, with this elevational data um, file here or archive, excuse me, um, we'll want to click extract all. Uh, it, it will probably say something different on Mac. Um, I'm not sure. Wh what does it say, Mary? Um, so Mary said usually you should just double click to get files or like open it. And it okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, so it seems like it's a lot easier on Mac. Oh, no. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sure. Um, okay, so uh, we'll want to extract it. It'll take a sec. I'm just going to minimize this for now. Um, well, since Eric has to re-download the file anyway, just have that file extracting in the background and let's add in another vector layer. Sorry to change the plan up on everybody. So um, we'll go back to layer, add layer, add vector layer. And close this. And then uh, click on this ellipsis again. And let's see here. Which one do we want to do now? Let's do, um, let's do roads. So I'm going to, let's, let's extract this interstates archive here. Okay, cool. So here we've got, you know, same sort of set where it's listing all the files in the archive. 
and asking us which of these layers to add. We just want the shape file, remember .shp. All of these other uh, uh, files here are just, are basically metadata. Okay, and then we'll click, oh, it's already been added. So we can click close. And you can see our, uh, our wonderful interstate uh, transportation network here. So um, I'm going to uh, select this guy, this interstate, and show, uh, and we'll just edit a couple of the properties of the uh, line here to make it look how we want it to. So we can click on um, the color of the line itself. Let's make that a nice, a blue color. Obviously, you don't have to do what I'm doing here. I'm just sort of messing around. Um, but we can also make the shapes more complex and more interesting. Um, and so let's say that I want to make this a sort of bold looking line. Um, I can do, uh, oops, I can make a line wrapped in a line basically. So I'm going to make this the I'm going to make a separate line here. So I've got two entries under this line tool thingy um, that I uh, that I and I I got that because I clicked on this plus button. So I've got a dark blue and a light blue. And so, but I want to make the stroke width on the dark blue line just a little bit wider. I'm going to change it from 0.26. I'm going to change it to point. Three nine. Um, let's see here. There we go. Um, so actually, let's make them both bigger. So I'm going to make this one one. And I'll make this one point five. And so it's kind of subtle, but you'll notice how what that does is. Um, this dark blue line is on the bottom, uh, and this light blue line is layered over it, and it's thinner, so it makes it look like it's wrapped in this dark blue sort of border. Um, it's a really subtle feature, but what it does is it, it, it makes these interstates sort of stand out. If we zoom in, um, uh, you'll find that it, it, um, it makes it more visually um, uh, it makes it pop out a little bit more. So whether or not you end up using that is definitely up for you to decide. Um, but there are uh, standards that are associated with um, making maps, um, like uh, cartographical standards. Um, and so they'll all use like the similar sort of line widths um, and like borders on interstates. Oh, I also want to mention here that we also need to set the coordinate uh, reference system for this interstate um, uh, uh, layer. You see that question mark there. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, but I'm gonna do it, um, again, there are two ways you can do that. You can uh, click on this and it'll pop up this menu and you can just try this WGS 84, or you can right click and say, Layer CRS EPSG 4326. And it's a good sign if you set the um, the uh, if you set the CRS and it doesn't and it's visible here. So just to show you, if I were to change the um, oops. If I were to change the uh, the CRS to something random, let's do, I'm just going to click on this NAD83. Notice how it, it like gets rid of it. Like I can't see it anymore. That's because I basically think about it as if you, uh, uh, if you had something in English and you tried to translate it into a different language, it'd just be nonsense. And so that's what I ended up doing. Uh, there's a question in the chat. So if mine doesn't have a question mark next to it, do I still have to set it? Uh, no, 
Um, that means that uh, your version of QGIS was able to automatically detect um, the, um, uh, the coordinate reference system. Um, again, this is only a problem that I've been having since, um, since using 3.16. Um, so if you're not running into the program or the, that issue, um, it's likely that uh, whatever version that you're using, or uh, it might have to do with your operating system or something, um, it's able to more intelligently detect it. Um, so uh, if, you, if there's no question mark there, don't worry about it. As long as you can see the layer, um, that's, the, that's the key. Okay, so... Um, so I changed the coordinate reference system on this to just a random one. And so now I'm gonna see, uh, it, 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 it's still displayed on the map. It's just in an area that, um, uh, that doesn't make sense in this coordinate projection. So in fact, oops, that might be it right there. We'll go to zoom to layer, okay. So uh, I just right clicked on this, uh, this layer and clicked zoom to layer. And so what you'll notice is look in the bottom of the screen uh, on the bar at the bottom where it says coordinate, you'll see it says negative 96 comma 23 where my cursor is right now. And then when I go to uh, the state boundaries, and I put it right here, we're at negative 97 and 33. So it changes the values that we are, um, uh, we're projecting into. And so that's what this guy is right here. It's total nonsense. Like it doesn't make sense for a tiny United States to be off the coast of, uh, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's what happens when you have, uh, incorrect uh, CRS. So we're gonna change this back to EPSG 4326, which is the WGS 84 projection system. And then suddenly everything's back to normal. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go back to um, uh, adding in our elevational data using our add raster layer tool. And then um, we'll go to the folder that, uh, that we extracted the elevational data to. And so from this folder, we want this massive uh, three gig uh, TIF file. Um, this has all of our elevational data that we could ever want for the US anyway. And then we'll just add it. And so uh, what happens is, um, you'll see this lovely, super high resolution screenshot in black and white, or not screenshot, um, image in black and white of the uh, lower 48 states. And this black and white is actually a mathematically translated uh, value between negative 85 and 4,195, uh, representing in meters the elevation of that specific pixel, basically. So white means that it's super high, black means that it's super low. Um, you'll also notice that this file has a sort of weird curvature associated with it. Um, the image itself does not. The image is just a, is like a flat rectangle. But again, because QGIS uh, reads in uh, these different data files and transforms them according to the um, uh, coordinate reference system that we're using, that means that these images get uh, bent and warped uh, so they can be translate, uh, translatable um, to a given data set. So, but this is, everything is working as intended here right now. So, um, all right, so now that we have this, uh, this file here, we can do a bunch of things with this um, layer. Oops. Oh, right, I forgot. Um, okay, so first things first, I forgot we want to have, we want to actually have um, these shapes, we want them to be transparent. So I dragged this layer all the way to the bottom um, because I want these other layers to appear on top of it. 
Um, but then I forgot that, you know, we, we made it white instead of transparent. So we're going to go back to uh, styles here. And um, uh, just a second, Eric. Um, and then we're going to go to edit symbol. Then we're going to go to simple fill. And then we're going to go to fill color and drag this opacity slider all the way down. And then click OK. That's better. Yeah, you had a question, Eric? Yeah, I'm not. No, well, I'm going to pull up the options. Oh, there it is. This is a different browser. No, I'm good now. Okay, cool. Question in the chat. Can you show that again? Absolutely. Okay, so um, I'm changing the, uh, I'm going to change the, um, uh, the opacity on our polygon layer for the uh, state boundaries. So to do that, I'm going to right click the layer, go down to styles, select edit symbol, uh, select the simple fill box, then click on this fill color. And then uh, I drag this slider of the opacity slider from 100% all the way down to zero. I clicked OK, clicked OK. And now it should give us this, uh, this transparency so we can see the elevational data behind the, um, uh, the state and interstate boundaries. OK, so the next thing we want to do is we want to mess with this raster layer, because while it's a cool looking image, um, it's not in exactly what we want uh, out of this layer. So we're going to right click on this layer and then go to styles. Oops, no, sorry. We're not going to go to styles for this guy. We're going to go to properties. So for this one, we are going to go to, uh, you'll see a list of tabs on the left here. We want to click on the symbology tab. And um, so uh, here we have a, a few different options that we can use for um, uh, visualizing these data. I'm going to show you um, uh, a couple actually. So I find that uh, the default representation of these data uh, as being black and uh, black being low elevation and white being high elevation, um, that doesn't translate super well visually to me. So I like to go white to black. And so all I'm going to do is change it, change that and then click OK. And you'll see that um, to me, this looks a lot easier. This is a lot easier to visualize. Um, so I'm going to zoom in on Arizona here, and you can clearly make out the Grand Canyon. Um, you can make out the Mogollon Plateau here. Um, uh, you can make out the Madrean Sky Islands in the southeast corner of the state. Um, uh, you can make out the Kaibab, so on and so forth. Um, and that's one way that we can we can visualize this. We can also tweak these values here. So if you double click on one of the entries, let's say that we're going to just forget about everything outside of Arizona. Um, and because this point right here is like the highest point elevation in the United States or the lower 48 anyway. Uh, but I think in Arizona, we only get up to like, I don't know, maybe 3,800 meters. So let's just change that and see how it happens or see what happens. Okay, so not a whole lot actually. Let's change. I'm gonna change it so it's really low so you'll be able to see what happens. So I'm gonna change this value to 1000. <laughs> so what that means is that everything above 1000 meters just becomes black, um, doesn't discriminate. Uh, and so that's not super helpful. But for the values between um, negative 85 and 1,000, there's greater contrast for each value. So it's, it's useful to sort of figure out what, what you want to consider your maximum um, and what you want to consider your uh, minimum. 
and not necessarily going with the default. That actually looks pretty good. Let's just, I'm curious. Let's just Google, let's just Google really quick. Um, highest elevation in Arizona. I should know this. Humphreys Peak, 3,800 meters. That was pretty close. All right, so we'll actually set this to 4,000 then. So just in case you're curious, Humphreys Peak is this little dot right here. Okay, so um, whatever you set your value to doesn't matter uh, for now. I was just gonna show you some cool stuff. Um, what we will do though, is we're gonna right click this and select duplicate layer. And this is one of the great things about um, uh, the way that GIS software works is that because it doesn't read data into the program and like stores it there, it just like uses the file. When we make copies of the layers, we're just changing how the software uh, visualizes the existing data. So it's not like we're making a three, a three gigabyte copy of a file, uh, if that makes sense. So, um, so again, just to refresh, um, I right clicked this file or this layer and selected duplicate layer. And so we're gonna rename this layer right here. And to do that, right click and select uh, rename layer. I'm just gonna say elevation, oops, hill shade. And so um, uh, remembering that uh, this checkbox means that the layer is visible, we're going to deselect this top one and select the elevation hill shade layer so that we're seeing the layer called elevation hill shade. And now we're going to right click this one and go back to properties. So we're here on the symbology tab and we're gonna go to, uh, we're gonna change this render type from single band gray to hill shade. Um, and hill shade is a great way for you to visualize hills along with other data types or data layers. So you can get um, some level of information about the steepness of, um, uh, of elevation change um, while also having other, uh, other data sources available. Okay, so um, we are going to mess with a few settings here. This Z factor is basically how exaggerated these elevational changes are. One is there's no exaggeration. We're gonna change it to five just for visualization purposes. Um, and then a couple other just like random things we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna change the blending mode from normal to multiply. What this means is that when there's another layer over it, it changes how it affects the color at which that layer is represented. And normal I've found doesn't really, it's hard to see under other layers. Multiply makes it um, so that this layer can actually still be faintly seen uh, underneath other layers. Um, it's just a sort of aesthetic thing. So uh, just to uh, restate, we're changing normal to multiply here. And then finally, uh, we're gonna change this nearest neighbor resampling from, uh, or to cubic. And this is also just an aesthetic thing. It changes how um, these hill shades appear when you're zoomed out versus when you're zoomed in. And, and then this is, th these are all mostly preference things. So feel free to tinker around with it and see what you like best. Um, you're not gonna break anything uh, if you change those values. Okay, so I'm gonna click okay here. And you should have something that looks roughly like this. Um, actually, I'm going to go back here, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna go back to properties and I'm going to change um, 
the brightness. I forgot to change the brightness. So I don't like uh, how it's gray in the background. I want it to be white. And I found just by messing around with numbers that 67 or thereabouts is a good value to change it so that the background is mostly white. So you see that looks a lot better to me. Um, okay, and then before we close out of this window, we're gonna click on the transparency tab and then change this from 100 to 75. Again, these are all sort of aesthetic changes that um, that uh, basically just make things appear a little bit less um, stark. So now we've got our nice hill shade layer here. Um, so that it looks like we can we can see rugged peaks um, and we can see areas where there's flat land where there are peaks that jut out of them um, with uh, with only a few clicks of the mouse here. Uh, nowadays, yeah, this is how they make those maps. Um, okay, a couple other things that we'll do here. Um, Got a question in the chat. So my interstate and state boundaries are not visible. Okay. Um, okay, so let's try. Um, so if you're seeing some layers, but not all of your layers, um, there are a couple of things that you can try. So first, um, uh, make sure that all of these boxes are checked so that you can, that these layers are indeed visible. Um, second, uh, when you add or um, when you right click on a, a layer, make sure that the layer CRS is set to um, uh, 4320 EPSG 4326 for all of your layers. And then the same thing for this guy. Oops. Ah, so that that might have been the issue there. That's right. I forgot that. Sorry, the um, uh, the elevational layers are not 4326. Um, let's see here. Can I undo and figure out what the uh oh, I forgot that. So the uh, 14303. Oh, 42303. Thank you, Mary. So, um, so the elevational layers. Uh, oh, interesting. Oh, okay. So it's NAD 83. Yep. So the elevational layers should be set to this um, NAD 83, um, which is another really common. Um, uh, coordinate reference system. It stands for North American Datum 1983. And this is the sort of um, uh, the North American, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, precursor or predecessor to the WGS 84. But it's still really commonly used today. Oh, why is it not? Still not showing up. Let's see. Zoom to layer. Ah. <sighs> We're running into the same problem as before. What'd you say? Let's see if one of these other NAD 83s. Uh, let me check. Uh, let me check the um, one of the metadata files here on the elevational data project. Albers NAD 83L48. Let's try this. So let's go to set layer CRS. Let's try typing in uh, Albers. There's a lot of them here. 
Oh yeah. The, another reason why um, there are a bunch of different CRS is that there are there are coordinate reference systems for uh, other um, uh, extraplanetary objects for you know Calypso, Ceres, Deimos, even even objects not even in our solar system. Okay, so let's go to NAD eighty three. Oops, is there an NAD 83 Conus Albers? Let's try this one. Ah, okay, cool. So try setting, um, if you're having a hard time visualizing the data or um, try setting your, um, uh, your elevation layers to, um, EPSG 5070. That is um, a specific projection of the um, NAD 83 standard. Let me know if that works for you. Is anyone else having a hard time visualizing any of their layers? For the elevational layers, yeah. Oh. Melik, do you have, uh, do you see the state uh, political boundaries? Okay. Um, have you read and have you been able to read in those layers? Or do they exist on your layers menu here? Okay. S um, and when you look at your elevational uh, uh, data, do you see the um, uh, do you see the bowing of the the image there? Okay, cool. Um, so what that means is your um, uh, your image is uh, or the elevational data are are probably fine. And it's just the other layers that aren't in the correct coordinate reference system. So um, uh, when you right click and select um, uh, zoom to layer on the interstates or the, um, uh, or the political boundaries of the states, do they appear when you click zoom, when you click zoom to layer? No, okay. And are these boxes checked? Okay, they are checked. So um, at this point, I would I would uh, I would just remove these layers and start again. So just right click and select remove layer, and then go back up to layer and select add layer, add vector layer, and then go back to your interstates and your political divisions and just add them again. And maybe it will, um, it will, sometimes that's all it takes and it will trick the computer into, um, uh, into refiguring out the correct coordinate reference system. Let me know if that makes something appear. Oh, that could be, yeah, yeah, uh, that's a great point. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, Mary just mentioned something else. Um, if your layer, your layer order will depend or will determine which, uh, what you see. So, and it starts from the bottom and goes to the top, or excuse me, it starts, starts from the top and goes to the bottom. Okay, so that made them come back. Okay, great. Um, so if I were to drag the elevation hill, elevation hill shade layer up to the top here, uh, I think it's thinking. Oh, that's weird. That is totally not what I would have expected. 
Um, it's weird that um, – oh, there we go. Um, it might be because, oh, right, the hillshade layer is transparent. That's why. Um, so the, the white areas are actually transparent areas. Um, but if you, so if I were to, let's see, I'll just put this back. If I were to deselect the hillshade layer, select the uh, black and white um, elevation layer, and then drag the elevation layer above the interstate and state boundaries layer, because it's just a flat image right now uh, with no transparency, it just completely covers all of our other data, uh, our other layers. And so we want to make sure that that layer is beneath um, our, uh, uh, our points and our lines, et cetera, so we can see everything. Um, and it's probably good practice to have the hillshade layer um, uh, low on the, the priority or the layer list as well. Uh, Melik was saying, now mine is fitted the way yours is. I just have different colors and I'm okay with that. Yes, and you should. Um, the, uh, I change these colors manually um, just to show some of the tools behind uh, how you can, uh, you can make those uh, changes. And just to refresh, that was under the styles menu. And feel free to play around with that as you see fit. So we're going to add one last layer. Actually, we're going to add two more layers here. I think we'll have time to do two more. Um, uh, and that, that one's, uh, so next we're going to add in our, uh, land use layer. So for that, we'll go to add another vector layer. Uh, and then under source, we'll click these little ellipsis. And then we're going to go back to, uh, my, on my computer, it's the political divisions folder and click on this land ownership .zip. And then we'll click add. Is it thinking? Oh no, it actually it added it. Okay. Yep, it's just for Arizona. Um, so, um, so for me, and and uh, perhaps you're not running into the same issue. It's not detecting the coordinate reference system. Um, so, and this is where, um, uh, this is where just blindly setting thing, everything to WGS 84 won't necessarily give us the, um, uh, desirable results. So I'll show you that and you'll see what happens. So, okay. So I can't see this on my screen. Um, uh, so, and it should be appearing right where Arizona is. So I'm going to go to land ownership, click zoom to layer and what the heck it's like way out here and it's giant compared to the United States. So, okay. So something's clearly wrong here. And then I look at the bottom of the screen where it says coordinate and I'm at the, in the like hundred thousands, um, in terms of what coordinate values I've got going on here. So, okay, so it's definitely not translated correctly. So I'm gonna set layer CRS again. And then remember when we downloaded these files, it says all data are in shapefile format, NAD 83 UTM zone 12. Um, and so uh, I am just gonna search UTM zone 12. And so it pulls up a list of different uh, reference systems here. Um, and I'm going to click, so if I were to select this one, it would still be incorrect because we're in NAD, not WGS. So I'm gonna scroll up here, NAD 83 UTM zone 12 N, and we're, it, this is 12 North and click OK. And then zoom to layer. Perfect. So we translated it correctly, basically. 
Okay, so um, again, I might be the only one who is experiencing this. Um, if so, uh, that's fine. But at least this way you have a sense of what different coordinate reference systems are and why they're so important to keep track of. Okay, so now we're gonna make this layer actually intelligible because right now it's just a bunch of rectangles. Um, so we're gonna go to the style, then go to edit symbol. Oops, sorry, wrong, wrong menu. We're not gonna go to styles. We're gonna go to properties. And under symbology, we are going to, um, it's, you'll notice that it's a relatively similar window to when we just edit the styles. But this one gives us actually a lot more flexibility in terms of what we can do. So we're going to change this single symbol, which is represented by this, for everything in this layer to a category-based uh, system. We're going to click on Categorized. And so um, and now this window is basically saying, OK, what, how are we going to categorize this? So we'll click on Value here. And this has a list of the fields that uh, are embedded into this file that we read in, this .shp file, um, that are all being stored in this, um, uh, in this file. And normally you wouldn't see them, right? Because we're just trying to visualize the data, but uh, this gets us into some of the deeper features of QGIS that hopefully we'll have the time to talk about at the end of the, the workshop here. So we're gonna click on Let's see, uh, I think it's, let's try category. So we're gonna click on category, and this is basically the column in a hidden Excel spreadsheet where each row is a different like box on the map. Um, and so we'll click classify here. And these are the different values in that field. So we've got um, uh, BLM land, uh, national forest land, Indian reservations, state parks, military bases, national parks, private use, uh, state trust, uh, wildlife refuges, and then other. Yeah, Eric? Okay, I didn't tell you the thing where you click classify and it puts it on there, right? Yep, you just click the classify button and it adds it all for you. Um, you can change the colors if you want but I'm just gonna leave it how it is right now. And then I'm also going to change the, uh, click on this big brown box here, and I'm just gonna change the opacity and lower it to maybe 66. So then that will let us see other layers through this layer. Click okay. So we've got our, <laughs> kaleidoscope of different uh, land uh, ownership here. Actually, I'm going to make one quick adjustment here. I'm gonna change uh, private. I'm gonna change private to transparent. And that'll be really helpful for just determining which land is privately owned versus owned by uh, various state and federal agencies. So just to, uh, just to walk through that again, I opened up the symbology tab again and then I double clicked on this private entry and changed the simple fill, uh, clicked on fill color, dragged the opacity all the way down. So privately owned land is gonna show up as transparent boxes. You can see various uh, swatches of privately owned land throughout the state. Okay, so if we might have, if we had more time, maybe we'd go through and make all of these really cool and informative colors. Um, but this is just to show you that you can do those things. Um, and, uh, and at any time you can reference, you can click on this uh, drop down arrow here and reference. Um, and in fact, you can even toggle on and off various layers to, so you can see what color represents what part of the map. Um, so you notice that Arizona has a ton of uh, land managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And that um, is actually uh, relatively unique. There are basically 
only in the western side of the United States is there any BLM land to speak of, in case you uh, weren't aware of that. Um, um, okay, so cool. And, and importantly, we can also see the elevational hillshade layer behind this, again, because we have the opacity turned down a little bit. So the last set of uh, the last data source that I want to add in today uh, that we have time for for now. Oh, and it's always a good idea to save. I should have done that before. Um, uh, so I just we're going to save this file. I'm going to save it as a uh, a QGZ for now. Um, a QGZ and a QGS are basically the same except in terms of how they store temporary use data. A QGZ uh, saves it in a different folder on your computer. A QGS file uh, saves it in the file itself. Um, uh, but that's, a, that's a, a feature that we don't really need to, to get into today. Okay. Um, all right, so are there any questions for me uh, right now before we start going into um, uh, the last set of data and certainly not least uh, biological data? I'll give the chat a few minutes in case they or a few moments in case they have any questions. Yeah, QGZ. Either one is fine, really. Um, uh, so. They'll both open just fine. Okay, I'm gonna uh, charge on ahead then. So um, the last uh, source of data that we will be using um, is uh, biological data. And we, so we'll go back to our outline here and we're gonna uh, go to uh, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility or GBIF. And GBIF is, as the name implies, a global repository for, um, uh, for organismal uh, diversity records. And what this means is um, natural history collections, observational portals, um, uh, all of these online resources uh, send their data to uh, GBIF um, as records of uh, the occurrence of a, an animal, plant, et cetera, at a given uh, in a given place at a given time. And so here at ASU Natural History Collections, we upload all of our data from our specimens that we have um, uh, in our collections, um, on our shelves, in our drawers, um, to GBEF for scientists, students, um, and the public to be able to use. So um, to access this site, um, you, can, uh, you can access the data um, uh, without signing in, but to download the data, you will need to create an account. So um, I'll give everyone a few minutes to um, create an account here. Um, uh, so you can, you can start to get a feel of how to, how to use GBIF.
All right, do folks need more time? Let me know if you're ready to, to continue. Got one ready. Got two readies. All right. I'm not hearing anyone say that they're not ready to continue. So let's keep going. So assuming you're logged in, uh, let's go to occurrences. And these are individual records um, that we can uh, filter any number of ways. And that's what's shown on this left bar here. So um, you'll have to bear with me here. I'm a mammalogist, I study mammals. So we're gonna use mammal data for this uh, workshop. But you could use any, any sort of data that you want here. You could specify the scientific name. We are going to specify uh, American pronghorn or antelope capra. Americana. So you, you type this in, it'll autofill. You want the ORD 1815 record, uh, species. A-N-T-I-L-O-C-A-P-R-A. Okay, so we have we have about 7,800 records here, but we want to um, filter this down. We're only looking for records from Arizona. So we click on these administrative areas box, and then just type in Arizona, click on the one that says state. Okay, this, this brings it down to 438 records. And then we want to um, we want to click on this location tab, and we only want records including coordinates because if they don't have coordinates, then they're not going to show up anyway. All right. So with those three filters, we should have 437 results, and we're going to download these. So this next page has three different options for us to download them. We're, we're gonna get the simple one. We just need a single file. And this page is just telling you that there, you cannot use these uh, results unconditionally. We have to cite our data when we use these. And this just acknowledges the work of the people who uh, put time and effort into making these data available and also making it so that people who um, uh, other, others who uh, view this, or excuse me, others who view the work that you create can find the data that you use to create that work. So, um, and it will actually help us cite the data set. So I clicked on understood and it's uh, processing the data. And it gives us a, um, a citation here. And we can actually just copy this. And I copied it. Yep, exactly. Um, and yes, we want simple data. So um, in fact, we could even navigate away from this page if we wanted to. Um, as you'll see right here, it'll send you an email when the data are ready. So I am going to navigate back to um, my map here and uh, 
Let's see here. Wait. It's still processing. Let's see. There's another data set here. GBIF. Oh, there it is. It's ready. Cool. Oh. What'd you say? Yeah, exactly. So once it's done preparing and yours uh, should finish very, uh, uh, it should finish shortly. Um, you'll click on this download button. It's thinking. Click on save. And you will go to, you know, create a folder here. I already have a folder. Uh, oops, I'm in the wrong area. Um, I'm going to go to vertebrae occurrence records. I've got Arizona pronghorn. I would save it as that. Click yes to replace in my case. Um, and so when I tried install or when I tried adding this layer, this was one of those where I had to extract it. So let's see. Oops. So I, I actually unzipped this already. So to, to remember to do that, you'll go to extract all, and then just create another folder. Oops. Oh no. Okay, here we go. All right, and now we are going to um, uh, add, we're, we're gonna add our last layer here. And this layer is a different type than any other layer we've added previously. This is under the uh, add delimited text layer field. Um, so we will still add in our data the same way we did before by clicking on this browse button. We'll find our, uh, our pronghorn data. Should have this weird name here. I'm actually gonna rename this right now. I'm gonna name this Arizona pronghorn, uh, GBIF occurrence records. Oops. Okay. Is there a certain kind of way to just download that file? Um, it should just come in a zip. Okay. Uh, um, uh, let me see your screen. I'll be right back, folks. You, you might have to extract the files in that folder. I had to, it was one of those where it wouldn't let me um, use it uh, archived. Yeah, it's put it in by itself to give me all this. Yeah, yeah, it probably because it's in an archive rather than uh, extracted. Um, okay, so yeah, so using that extracted uh, .csv file, your um, the file format should by default have the CSV comma separated values uh, selected. Oh, we've got a question in the chat. Um, uh, so Melik asks, what does a delimited layer do? Um, a delimited layer is just another, it's a, a, a file format that has um, different fields specified um, uh, through the use of a, a specific delimiting character. And that can be a comma, it can be a space, it can be a tab. Think about it like um, a spreadsheet or a table, but instead of like boxes, like uh, representing how fields are separated from one another or cells are separated from one another, you have comma, 
or tab and then enter. Uh, where commas represent the differences between columns and enter represents the differences between rows. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we're adding in uh, this uh, file here. So I'm going to make this a little bit wider. So when you've selected your, um, your CSV file, your, um, uh, which the file that I've named Arizona Pronghorn GBIF Occurrence Records.csv, the file format will give you a couple different options here. Um, the, the default that is, uh, should be selected is CSV or comma separated values. Um, and you, the, the description here, it's a comma separated value file where fields are delimited by commas and uh, quoted by quotation marks. Um, so as we're changing these options here, it will, it will give you a preview of what that table looks like based on the options you've selected. So with this comma separated values uh, option selected, notice how the columns are all just like mashed together here. Uh, you can't see any boxes separating the rows, or excuse me, the columns on this data sheet. And they're like, this is ugly. This isn't how the data are supposed to look. So, okay, so whatever this, the CSV comma separated values file is not translating the data correctly. So it's probably not separated by commas. So let's go to this regular expression delimiter and enter in uh, backslash T. Not, uh, not to be confused with forward slash. And this indicates to the, um, uh, to the, uh, the algorithm, I guess, that, that, that the, the cells are separated by tabs rather than commas. And notice that when we do that, all of a sudden, look at these beautiful boxes here. Everything is properly delimited here. We have separate columns, separate rows, and even importantly, the geometry has been defined correctly. So we've got, and the X field represents longitude by this field, the, uh, excuse me, this field in the data set, the CSV file called decimal longitude, and the Y value is uh, delimited or is uh, designated by this decimal latitude field. And that's what we want. In fact, if we were to go back to CSV here, Notice how it removes the, the, um, the separation here. And we also can't even add it. This option is grayed out. We can't add this file unless we have those fields prepared. Okay, so we're gonna click add and then close. All right, so we have our, uh, we have our point data and they should be visible. I'm going to click on this guy right here and turn off this layer for now so we can see this other layer underneath. And so I've got a question in the chat. So it won't let me choose add. Okay, if that's the case, then probably, well, let's see, we'll go back to layer here. Um, make sure that you have, oops, so make sure that you used backslash T here rather than, so if you use forward slash, it won't work. It has to be a backslash. Um, and make sure that the X field is specified as decimal longitude and the Y field is specified as decimal latitude. Mary, did you have something? Ah, excellent. Okay, Mary. Uh, Mary said that she had to manually set this to WGS eighty four. Okay, thanks, Mary. Does that work for you, Malik? Awesome. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, yeah, I, I forgot that sometimes it doesn't automatically set the uh, coordinate projection system. Okay. So, um, so these are our occurrence records um, for uh, Arizona pronghorn. And so let's just, you know, poke around with these data 
and use some of the visualization tools of uh, QGIS. So first, I'm going to change this symbol. So I double clicked on this symbol here. I want to make the color a lot brighter so I can see it very clearly over these other layers. I'm just going to make it neon green. We're going to have a, an 80s uh, disaster piece of color here. Oh, those are still super sm small and hard to see. Oh, help me bring it over to the for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. I should definitely do that, huh? I'm also going to make the size bigger. Let's double it. Let's make it from two to four. There we go. All right. Much better. So we can do a few things here. Um, we can, and, and we're near, I know we're running a little bit over, but we're, we're nearing the end of the, the workshop anyway. Um, so we can select the layer of interest and, um, and now go over to these tools right here. So we can click on identify features. And so this is be now that you've got a GBIF account and now that you have this sort of base map um, generated, this will help you orient yourself spatially to um, all sorts of uh, data associated with uh, uh, occurrence records of any type, whether they're animal, plant, or beyond. So I'm going to click on one of these guys. And uh, I just clicked on a point, And it actually, because my mouse was so close to these four, it selected all four of them. And it pulls up on this identifying features, uh, identified results tab here, um, the, the records for these four um, individuals that I can drop down independently. And so I click on these and it tells me all of this information about uh, this, per the, this particular record. So for instance, this is a, a record from iNaturalist. So it's an observation record rather than a specimen, like a natural history specimen. Um, institution code, iNaturalist, basis of record, human observation. Um, let's see, we have, um, uh, the person who uh, recorded the observation. Um, we have the date that that observation was recorded, um, so on and so forth. I want to see if we have any occurrence records or uh, um, uh, specimen based records. These are all, so these are all, they all look like they are um, observations. Let's go to another part of the state. Do you have a question, Eric? Sorry, so make sure that the, uh, the Arizona pronghorn layer is selected and then click on the little um, uh, cursor with the eye symbol next to it. And then that will let you select any, any of these dots here. And when you select those, it should automatically appear with that identify results tab on the right. Um, show an overview. Let's see. Can I see your screen, please? So that guy right there, did you click on that? Oh, I think an actual I. No, sorry, the letter I. My mistake. Yeah. And then you yeah, click on one of those dots there. Okay, so um, uh, let's see, more observations. Wow, look at this guy. We have observations. We can actually filter. Can we, uh, let's see, expand. Oh, let's see, identify features here. Open field calculator. Let's see if we can do this. So I clicked on this little abacus here. Oops, no, sorry. Um, I think I want to do open attribute table. So I click on that little table record there. Uh, let's go to, 
uh, select. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go to select slash filter features using form. So uh, we'll click on this little funnel here. And we will, um, let's see, we will find um, basis of record. Let's see here. We don't want that. Oh, weird. No. Oops. Sorry, I accidentally. Um, accidentally clicked on that. Okay, so we want basis of record. We want it not not equal to oh what is the precise wording that they use let me just check this real quick we want it not equal to human observation we want actual specimens so we clicked on this basis of record field and changed this value to not equal to and then we're just going to type human observation oh actually auto completes it cool all right, and then let's go to let's go to what happens when we click filter features here. So this pulls up a list of seventeen uh, individuals here, where the um, let's see. The basis of record is preserved specimen. This, this, this first specimen in, in my search results here is actually uh, one of the ASU mammal collection specimens. And we can, um, let's see. Yeah, so we can actually, let's see. I'm trying to move this out. Let's select this guy and then bring the table up here. It actually highlights the the um, the record on the map, but there are so many it's actually kind of hard to see. Oh, I see. It makes a little bit of a blip inside it temporarily. So let's zoom in on this guy. So it zoomed in right here. Where is this record? Okay, so this is in um, probably, I think that's Navajo County. Um, so this is just, this lets you sort of play around with different features. Um, it gives you an opportunity to find out more about the data that you, uh, you've you downloaded in a way that is spatially explicit. Um, and you can even use it to find areas where there's been, according to whatever repository that you're looking through, and sort of like what Eric was saying um, uh, at the start of the workshop, where you can find places that people have never gone collecting, or at least have never uh, gone collecting and then deposited those specimens or made observations in a database that is um, uh, publicly accessible like GBIF. Um, anyway, so, um, we're a little bit over time. I'm uh, sorry about that, but uh, um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, thanks so much for uh, for uh, joining me on this uh, this little workshop here. I hope you found it helpful um, and uh, gave you uh, the the beginnings of a set of tools that you can use um, to add in other data that we didn't get the chance to look at today. Um, and um, like I was saying before. Feel free to use the um, uh, the QGIS tutorials linked in that uh, Google Doc um, uh, for more in depth information. Uh, Melik asks, uh, "Will you be doing another workshop?" Um, so, um, if there's enough interest, I might do another one in the future. Um, Right now, um, I, uh, I don't really have any plans to. Um, the, the big thing that I didn't get the chance to do today um, is to uh, show you all how to make maps as that you could use for figures. Um, 
And uh, that's a, something that I could probably do, um, but not until late in the spring. Um, so uh, if there's still interest in uh, exploring some more of those uh, features, um, uh, send me an email um, and keep reminding me. Um, uh, my email is drousey at asu.edu um, and I will add it to the Google Doc as well. So feel free to continue using that for the future. Um, and uh, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you come across in your own exploration of, uh, of QGIS. Are there any uh, final questions before I end the stream? This one right here? Yeah, Eric is just wanting to know how to get to this field calculator or um, uh, attributes table. And to do that, you just click on this table box right next to the identify features button. And then to get from here, uh, you click on, or you can also, you can click on this filter uh, button right here and then enter in any sort of filtering category that you want. I was using the human observation basis of record to change that, but um, yeah. Thank you. I saw the key. So. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Any final questions? All right. Well, I guess that concludes the workshop. Um, thank you so much for uh, for joining us, uh, joining me, and um, uh, enjoy the rest of the semester. <laughs>